on a science podcast about everything deep sea. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. With me is the professor, Alan Jameson. Hello, mate. Morning. Morning. Before we get started, just a quick thank you to all of our lovely patrons. People are continuing to join. Uh, and just thank you so much. I, I really wasn't sure Patreon was an avenue to propagate the show. Like, I'm just amazed that people give so generously just to keep us going. So massive thank you. And the new thank yous for this one is Andy K. Nick, Trace Ritchie, Harley Pollitt, and Alice. So thank you so much for uh, helping keep the show going. How are you getting on, Alan? Any updates from you? Oh, all sorts of updates with many fans of the podcast around recently. Yeah, you've had some IRL in real life interactions. I did. So we had one of our patients turn up at the... I did a, a talk uh, for an event called Raising the Bar, where scientists sort of commandeer pubs around Perth and give a talk about stuff. So I went to that and met some podcast fans of us. One of them, Rosa, I believe her name is, he was even wearing the T-shirt. Happy days. Hey. Uh, I met your friend Kat, squid and octopus expert. She's over in Perth right now. She's your friend too now. My friend too now. Took her to barbecue the other night. <laughs> and geology legend Heather Stewart's here with all her staff from edinburgh so it's been a busy old busy old couple of weeks there's people everywhere busy social mingling schmoozing yeah yeah it's uh it's been great there's, there's all sorts of new faces kicking around i've not seen for a while well for last month happy hagfish day everyone which i was only made aware of by the patreon discord um so the third friday of october is hagfish day and uh, we're now up to the 12th year of Hagfish Day. Uh, it was started by the Whale Times, an oceanography blog, to celebrate the weird and ugly animals that are still important for the environment. So happy Hagfish Day. And in honour of Hagfish Day, the soundtrack for this month is The Hagfish Incident by Louis Zong. So the incident it's referring to is a truck carrying 7,500 pounds of live hagfish failed to stop and then spilt its load on uh, Oregon's State 101 highway. And um, yeah, it just, hagfish are good at making slime. So it just made the whole road slimy. There's some brilliant shots of like a, a Toyota Prius, I think it is, covered in slime. Uh, and so that gives the, the song the chorus, which I, I really enjoyed. It was, as the tanks fall down, slime will coat your Toyota Prius. Um, so that is the song of the month. I've seen the pictures. I don't know why I assumed it, it, it wasn't in the States. I didn't know they transported. How do they pick the date for these days? Like, how Why is it the third Friday of October? Is there a reason behind that? Is that when the incident happened? Oh, I think you just pick a thing and then you make it a thing. Oh, okay. But I, I'm, yeah, who is, who is in charge of picking when these things happen? Because I found a website called National Day Calendar, which is where I found out the details about how fish day. I think you can just pick a day and they must overlap. We've got more than 365 like things. So you must have to like argue over them. <laughs> I bet there's been some inappropriate lineups as well. I bet there's been some oh, yeah. sort of contradictory, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> contradictory yeah. ethos uh, sort of coming out on the same day. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Hagfish. Hagfish is great, though. I've got a strange admiration for hagfish. I mean, I must admit, I don't particularly like them, but you got to admire them in terms of how primeval they are and how resilient and how they don't care that they're so different from everything else in the neighbourhood. <laughs> they, they do win you over once you start studying them. They just don't care. You know what I mean? It's just, they just come along. Like, I'm loving this and I might make everyone else's day harder, but so what? I'm a hagfish. That's what I do. Andrew Stewart from the fish team here wants us to do a, a special hagfish episode. So we could we could stretch it to a whole episode. I'm sure we could actually. They are weird enough. They probably do warrant in their own episode. I've got a few hagfish stories as well. Yeah, the slime response, the how strong the skin is, that that collagen like lattice that makes up their skin, like it dulls your scalpel blade almost immediately. Yeah. They're impossible to kill. I know I've got a story about me trying to kill one. Trying and failing. Did it win? <laughs> in, in the end, no, it didn't. Uh, I did have an advantage in the fact that we were both in air. That was certainly an advantage to me. Yeah, the home team advantage. Uh, yeah, uh, but no, they're hard as nails. Absolutely hard as nails. Yeah. And the depth I brought them up for and they're still alive is phenomenal. You know, just like, how is this thing still trying to get off the table? <laughs> it's like, surely you should be at least somehow disadvantaged by this. They're like, nah, I'm a high fish. I'll find my way back to the sea with or without you in this life or the next. <laughs> the biggest extant species is found around here, the Goliath. Yeah. And it's like over a metre long. It's a it's a chonky, chonky boy. 
Anyway, we should save these stories for an actual hagfish episode. Yes, yeah, but if we'll gauge response, if you really want to do a hagfish episode, like let us know, and we'll right. uh, we'll gladly deliver random other little bits and pieces from around the internet. I well, actually, you found it, Alan, when you doing a little sweep of uh, snailfish images. Um, there was a uh, nice bit of fan art of the blue Atacama snailfish as a sort of mermaid character thing, mm. and I tried to get in touch with the artist, but it looks like it looks like they were really, really popular. They've got an insane following online, and it looks like that following was like a little bit too much that they're quite an introverted person and the the following sort of got to them so they kind of retired and said that if they ever surface again it will be under a new name oh. so yeah weird I, I tried to get in touch with the artist and talk about it and just be like hey like that picture that you used as, used as a reference that was one of our shots yeah. but no they've gone uh, they've gone banished but on that same sort of thread the remember the bibby yes tracked that down to an rpg project called snail morning which is going to be a computer game based on a hadal snailfish and so i've gotten in touch with the people who created that because that shot of the sort of nice normal surface fish horrible fish and then the bibby at the bottom which is the the hadal snailfish i want to use that actually and i'd like to talk to the artist and see what that project is so i've, I've reached out to them and i'm not sure if we're going to hear back Very strange well, there's a lot of snailfish out right there. That's why I came across it because it was it, more and more people were sort of sending them and bringing them to my attention and saying, oh, "Have you seen this? Have you seen that?" And so one day I just sort of sat down and put in snailfish art or something like that, and it was this whole heap of it out there. It's great. They're charismatic. They win people over. Yeah, a lot of it, you know, you, you can tell is you know, some of it is just generally just snaily stuff, but there's a lot of it where you can tell is directly from images, which is great. All for that. Yeah, the 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 blue Atacama one was uh, it like has our images inlaid in the mm. in the picture to say that it was it was the inspiration. It's a really nice drawing, actually. I like a bit of art, mm. like art inspired science. There's lots of that going on on the Discord right now as well because it's Inktober, so lots of drawing prompts uh, around deep sea critters. Beautiful stuff coming out. Cool. Should we dive? into some news go for it well the first one you had a hand in alan the hadel blend coffee is now available for those who want to taste the hadel zone or, or it's more a coffee blend inspired by the hadel zone isn't it yes and i think it's only available in japan all the best stuff is we've recently received a batch of it uh because we had someone in the group go to japan and collect it and our japanese colleagues tried to actually post it to us i think multiple times and it kept getting knocked back so uh, you need to go to Japan for it. But what it is, is, is we did a big Japanese expedition last year and the lead scientist from Japan's, don't quote me this, but I, th- I think his brother owns a coffee company. <laughs> and so there was a lot of lost in translation moments. If you've ever seen that film, we felt a bit like that of this guy going, what does the Hail Zone taste like? And I'm like, well, salty, salt war, <laughs> I can't guess. <laughs> you know, and, and they kept asking us for words to describe how you, could you blend coffee to represent the deep sea? And I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, it's dark, so there's a thing. We can have dark coffee, I don't know. It's a, it's a kind of fun thing that Japanese people do, I guess. But there's five different packagings, if you like, of, of this Hadel coffee. And so one of them's got a little cartoon of our submarine on it. One's got a Unicini's amphipod on it. One's got a snailfish on it one has some of the crinoids and anemones from the triple junction and it's a big super giant one of them so it's kind of it's kind of cool it, it was just one of those really odd things to be dealing with whilst whilst trying to write up the science and then it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah they're, like, they're like a bit of merchandise but it's it's good science communication it's good sort of following different channels oh, i don't know if it is because when someone keeps saying you know how to express your love of the deep sea through coffee flavors i'm like i don't know what to say I just, I don't <laughs> it's know too what abstract to yeah it's really hard i'm like i just kept going I, I guess it should be dark but surely that's up to the person who makes it of whether or not they put milk in it or not i don't know where this is going so yeah it's funny. Well, apparently one of the quotes they got back from from asking the team was a sunday morning coffee with depth and complexity of flavor full of possibilities and without stress Hadel zone. It's just nonsense, isn't it? It's, it was, it's funny. <laughs> it's the people who re- write the back of wine bottles. Yeah. With hints of strawberries. Does it have strawberries in it? No, then you're imagining it. Yeah. <laughs> Subtle whiffs of sawdust. Slight smell of granddad's hands. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's funny. We've got Hadel coffee now. It's not the real deal, though. The first the first ever Hadel coffee was me and my mate Toil, and we took an old temperature sensor that was broken, but we put the housing back on the lander and filled it with coffee granules, and we sent it down to 7,700 metres, brought it back up. And they made ourselves a little nice little cup of coffee. That was the original little coffee. Could have actually been there. And there's been a couple of times since, because uh, we did it on the Comatic trip as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Andrew wrote a blog about it. I'll put it in the links. Right. Yeah. It was just, I think it was just Nescafe granules, but you know. <laughs> oh, it's instant. <laughs> yeah. It was instant. Oh, nice. 
Yeah, I've got a picture of me in my old orange mug, just having a delicious cup of Halo coffee somewhere over Japan Trench somewhere. I wonder where that, that mug is now. I've got it. You have? I know you retired it. Yeah. Is it, is it on the shelf like a trophy? Uh, it should really be in a display cabinet at work, but I don't think anyone would understand the significance of... Well, it should be locked away. I don't know if it's a display cabinet, but it should be locked away. Well, it's one of those things like, you know, like the Holy Grail is probably not this beautiful sort of uh, goblet. It's probably just a wooden cup. It's, it's humble. Yeah. And if, if you didn't know what you're looking at, you may go, oh my God, that's disgusting and throw it in the bin. And then a little piece of history is gone. So Never to be reclaimed. Have we spoken about the Goblet of Hades? Have we told told this story? I'm not sure. So yeah, well, it's a pretty easy story, I guess. In South Africa, I was joining a ship down there and well, it must have been 2005. And I went to a supermarket and realised that the mugs on the ship were absolutely disgusting. I was going on at sea for six weeks. So I went to a supermarket and bought a plastic big big round really stupid sort of foamy plastic cup it doesn't look food safe it wasn't good plastic no it doesn't uh i kept that <laughs> mug going for oh, i would say 11 years and to the point that it's only, it was only when i actually resigned from Aberdeen university did the cleaners tell me that they've actually tried several times to clean it uh, <laughs> and then we started to delaminate and all sorts yeah it was all flaking off the inside it did become a, a real health hazard in the end so eventually i retired it and that was the original gobble of hades that's also been down to considerable yeah. deaths. i don't know i can't remember it's what. gone on a few joints that one it has and so that was quite, that was quite an epic one, and it's been on lots of TV shows as well. I normally have it sitting in the back somewhere, like a little Easter egg. <laughs> and, uh, there you go, Easter egg for people. Whenever Alan's in a dock, look for a bright orange mug in the background. Yeah, and then it was retired when I moved to Newcastle, but then I went through a dark the dark ages where I didn't have a mug per se. I didn't have a, a goblet. It was a hard thing to replace. It was so personal. Yeah, and somebody ended up buying me like a Mr. Happy mug and then someone in a tactic got shot off the desk and smashed all over the floor and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's the story. Oh, it shot off the desk. Yeah. <laughs> it hit, wasn't, hit the wasn't hurled over the horizon. <laughs> oh, no, no, I went off. Yeah, somebody <laughs> somebody actually threw a bit of it in the sea, which annoyed me a little bit. So there is a little piece of it lying in Antarctica. But then uh, I didn't get on with that mug very well. I didn't like it. But then Heather Stewart, who I mentioned earlier, bought me uh, one for my birthday, which has actually got Goblet of Hades written on it. Oh, nice. And it's a bamboo with a metal insert, stainless steel inside, and a little foamy bottom on it to stop it slipping at sea. And that's the one that I use at the moment. So Goblet of Hades 2.0. I haven't met the replacement. Oh, you have. You have. Have I? Have I seen the Goblet of Hades? I would have had that on the Red Sea job in the, the second ah. Puerto Rico one, I think, because it was a bit, yeah, you would have seen it. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I've still got the, the orange one somewhere. One day, it'll end up in a museum. And people will say, that's the mug. <laughs> that's, that's the one he was talking about. That's the yeah. one from all those documentaries. Yeah. Goblet of Hades. In other news, uh, we've spoken about neutrino telescopes before. Both me and Alan were involved in some projects in the Mediterranean, trying to use that very clear water as a, as a lens. The Tropical Deep Sea Neutrino Telescope, or Trident Project, has recently been announced. So it's, it's based out of China. It is 3.5 kilometers deep abyssal plain. And they're going to an anchor over 1,200 vertical strings, each 700 meters long, with uh, lots of high resolution digital optical modules. So spanning a, a four kilometer diameter. And yeah, there's going to be a few test sites put out first, and then it's going to sort of join IceCube and the other the other neutrino sites to monitor neutrinos intercepting. And it's got a really interesting sort of layout. The, the other ones were sort of radial s strings, whereas this is sort of a spiraling Mandela looking structure with a, a weird star in the middle. Um, so, yeah, if that uh, if that all gets built, that's going to be a pretty extensive project. They didn't mention much about sort of deep sea life interactions um, because I, I don't know if the photomultipliers have advanced since me and you were doing it, but bioluminescence was a big problem. And that was part of why you were involved and then why the Mediterranean was selected. Mm. No, that was my second postdoc. I was running around the Mediterranean looking for nothing. Quiet bits. Looking for a place where nothing existed. <laughs> looking for pure darkness. And yeah, we found it in the engine. <laughs> of Greece, beyond 3,000 meters, is pretty much completely dead because the, the issues with neutrinos is they're subatomic. So when they pass through a medium like water, they give off muons, and the muons are detectable via Cherenkov radiation, which is a little flash of blue light. But the, the blue, which it gives off, happens to be 480 nanometers, which is the same as bioluminescence. So if you put down 10,000 super, super sensitive photomultiplier tubes to look at this nanosecond burst of 480 nanometers, it's a static object in moving water. And then gelatinous animals that are bioluminescing at the same wavelength, moving through moving water, hit the array <laughs> and give off a whole heap of photons. And so it all started when they did uh, the Antares 
their way off Marseille, they put one down there and switched it on and realised it just saturated because it was just so much, so much bad luminescence in the water. So I haven't spoken to a biologist. Yeah, it was one of those ones where it was like a really big, massive, really expensive EU project on subatomic physics and you know ultimately looking for dark matter in the universe it became very much about marine biology and so yeah i used to mm. jump on ships all the time and go around mediterranean in search of darkness yeah. in search of the ultimate darkness i i, I feel the quote and some merch coming on in search of the absolute darkness yeah no one leaves until we found nothing <laughs> <laughs> that was basically the, the premise behind it because I'm like oh man look at that big bioluminescence like oh no that's not yes, it was yeah, the opposite boom. of what all the biologists want <laughs> just like oh look at that and like oh no yeah. no nah, nah, nah. eventually like here's four hours of us pushing a uh, ultra low light camera vertically through the water and you come back with like two or three hours of absolutely nothing and then they're like yes well done Al you've done it it's like they could just not have anything recorded on them. You realise that. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it was a weird job to be involved in, but it was fascinating hanging around with a lot of crazy physicists. Yeah, you get to rub some interesting shoulders. Yeah, I got to sit in a lot of dusty harbours around the Mediterranean, just sort of dying of sunstroke and stuff like that. It was a funny, funny old time, sitting on like 5,000-year-old walls, waiting for a courier to arrive. That's what I remember from the EU projects. The neutrinos are weird ones, so they, they, they pass through most things. And actually, this new array is going to be looking at neutrinos that have already passed through the Earth. Mm -hmm. So the chances of them colliding with matter is really, really slim, which is why you use a massive volume of water in the hope that one of these, just by chance, bumps into one and sets off this little little flash. But they've already passed through the planet, so it's uh, it's incredible. So they're already exhausted by the time they get to the array because they've had to push through the planet's core. Oh, well, they've just been spewed out by, uh, well, not even just, like potentially thousands of years ago, been spewed out by uh, a supernova, and then they come all this way and bump into the, the stupid old earth mm. <laughs> or some some 3000 meter deep water right next to a photo multiplier so mm. that's the win that's how you get immortalized that's how they get famous uh there's been some uh nice hydrophone recordings out at the abyssal plain minima Torishima island yeah this it's a terrible job for the dyslexic found there is a daily and seasonal pattern in the seascape uh, over five kilometers deep so the noise was mainly an evening fish chorus mm -hmm. So a little chirruping and noises from the fish as they move up and down. And then marine mammals singing. So the first one sort of gave you a daily cycle with the, the diel migration of the scattering layer going up into the shallows at night and then down during the day. And then a bit of seasonality with the migratory marine mammals. So that could be allowing these animals to coordinate their movements. Uh, it gives a nice indication of, of a clock, basically, of how um, deep sea animals could time their seasons. Uh, you know, scavengers might be after some whale falls, so they might want to get under the migratory paths where a lot of whales die because it's such a, a tough thing to do uh, that most of them die on their migration routes. So, yeah, I, I think sound probably plays a, a bigger part in the deep sea than we're, we're realising. Yeah. Uh, it's good to get some hydrophones down there. I think a lot of the, the fish sing and chitter and drum. We certainly know they have structures dedicated to them. And then interesting things like in the Cuskills where the, they would both have drumming muscles, but the males have bigger ones. So there's obviously a bit of sexual advertising uh, with the males. You know, if they can make their, their voice sound nice and deep, it shows off that they're a large male because it's difficult to, one, it's difficult to coordinate mating. It's difficult to find a mate. But then how do you show off what a good prospect you are? How do you show off I'm a really big male or I'm a really successful male without seeing each other? So I think uh, the pitch and volume might be part of that. And then the final one was on how elephant seals hunt in the deep sea. So we know that the whales can use their echolocation and that helps them dive down deep and eat things. But what about things that can't use that, uh, especially when they're going down into the deep sea where things are quite spread out? So tags were placed on some elephant seals, 25 females, to record the predator-prey behavior when they're interacting. And even though they don't have the echolocation, they still seem to have a sensory advantage over their prey that allows them to detect it just five to 10 seconds before striking. So they get a little bit of jump on the prey that are down there. So that is a sort of range of seven to 17 meters where they can stealthily approach a specific prey. And they even identify different forms of hunting based on the prey type. So they're, they're identifying what they're going after and adapting their hunting to do with that. And that's how they manage to, even going down that deep where everything's a bit sparse, they're managing to uh, locate up to 2,000 prey items and swim more than 100 kilometers per day. Do you know what the deepest diving seal is? Uh, I don't. I don't. I know we looked it up. I've got it in front of me. 
Oh yeah, go on. Well, there was a paper that I can't remember what it was now, but it was it was someone in I think uh, Southern Ocean was looking at the effect of long lining, and they put like a long lining hook down, or whatever, and trying to film it, and it was like twelve hundred meters. And one of the shots, because like, they took like a, like a thousand photographs, and one of them was just a seal looking in the camera, and it was just like what? <laughs> yeah, and that's like that's mega deep. But they, there's a paper by. The authors are DeLong and Stewart, 1991, called Diving Patterns of Northern Elephant Seal Bulls in a journal called Marine Mammal Science. And they tagged one and recorded it at a depth of 1,529 metres, which is mental. Yeah. From seal? That's a long way to go, let alone a long way to dive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with, uh, weirdly, actually, coming back to our hagfish, the elephant seals, I think, are one of the few things that eat them because their whole slime defence thing is built around choking the gills. Yeah. And if you have lungs... It doesn't work. Yeah, it just tastes bad. But yeah, knowing how hard they are to kill, I'd certainly want to chew that before swallowing it. Because <laughs> I think a hagfish would just burrow out. I think it would just bore a <laughs> hole through the shortest distance between the inside of you and the outside of you. <laughs> you know, I, I think it would, it would even take its time. It would even like turn the tables and just hollow you out. I reckon it would probably eat its way <laughs> of you and then back in and then back out again, just to prove a point. Yeah, <laughs> like a sewing machine. Yeah. Just ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Uh, so the general sort of air-breathing diving critters that do enter the deep sea, the record holders are things like the emperor penguins at 500 metres, leatherback sea turtles at 1,200 metres, sperm whales at 2,250 metres, and the record holders, the beaked whales, at almost 3,000 metres. And that must be an incredibly stressful thing to put your body through. And so that is going to be the topic of this episode. So we are going to speak to someone about the beaked whales. Visitors to the deep sea, but we'll allow it because they're cool. I'm joined by Dr. Nicola Quick, lecturer in marine conservation at the University of Plymouth and an adjunct assistant professor of marine science and conservation at Duke University. Her research focuses on the ecology and behavior of marine mammals, particularly on how marine mammals use acoustic signals and how anthropogenic noise, so noise from people, affect their behavior. Thanks for coming on to have a chat with us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me along. We are a deep sea show, but uh, it turns out there are some air breathing marine mammals that go into the deep sea, which are the sort of big deep diving species. So there are a few of our cetacean species that, that like to head down to the deepest parts of the ocean. Probably the one that people know the best is the sperm whale. That's one of the larger whales that often features on whale watching trips in certain places, um, New Zealand obviously being one of the common places you can go and see those guys. Another one is pilot whales. Uh, they're pretty deep divers as well, although in comparison to the, the next group I'm going to mention, the pilot whales are probably pretty moderate deep divers. And then you have the the beaked whales or the the family Ziphidae, or the Ziphids we call them, that are what we term our sort of extreme deep divers out of the groups of cetaceans. And for a lot of folk, nothing is going to pop into their brain when they hear the term beaked whale. I think a picture pops up when they hear whale and then I say beaked and a beak doesn't really fit on the, <laughs> on the classic shape of a whale's head. So if somebody was looking at a beaked whale, what, the, what would they be looking at? Well, interestingly, they're actually quite a large family of um, cetaceans. So cetaceans are the word we use for, for whales and dolphins. And they're actually the second largest family after the dolphins. So that common image that people have of what a, a small dolphin looks like, your, your bolo's dolphin that you see on the TV or in, in Dolphinarium. And there's actually 22 species of the beaked whales in the family Ziphidae. And getting that normal search image is quite hard because actually they, they're quite different in some of their, their body shapes. Obviously, they're... Um, that nice streamlined shape that we associate with a whale, but they can range in size from four meters up to sort of 13 meters, depending on the species that, that you're looking at. Um, and often they sort of have quite sort of bulbous torpedo shaped bodies almost with a small beak at the front that you might associate with uh, something like some of the smaller dolphins. And then going into a shape at the back of their tails tend not to have a, a notch like we we associate with other whales and dolphins. Um, and then the really different thing about them is, is unlike something like a big humpback whale that people might have seen on the TV that have those big white pectoral fins, beaked whales have very small pectoral fins, so those fins on the sides of their bodies. So they look like these sort of stubby little fins, and that's just to make them as streamlined as possible to help them as, the, as they're diving deep down into the ocean. Oh, that's amazing. So one of the most specious groups, one of the most diverse families of whales and dolphins, Dolphins 
it's not one that pops up in our minds and that we'll dip into why they're so infrequently seen. What are they doing out there? How are they, how are they living their lives? Well, well, you're right. They are. They're actually one of the least known groups of mammals out of, of any groups of mammals. So that's, that's why people don't have that search image. And the thing that probably makes them even less known to, to humans is where they're actually living. So these guys live in, in deep water areas. And that can be around off deep drop off zones or also they can be island associated if you have some areas where there's some steep drop offs around islands. So those ones might be seen by people a little bit more frequently, but but typically they're in these deep offshore waters that are not really that accessible for your average uh, human to, to get to unless you've got a well-equipped boat to actually get out there and see them. And the really interesting thing with these guys is even though we say there's about 22 species, some of these have only really been described in the last couple of decades. And there's still a few of those species that we maybe only know from a, a skull that has been found washed up on a beach. And really out of all of those species, there's only three or four that are reasonably well described. And that's due to how far offshore they live um, in the areas that are harder for us to get to. And also, they're not one of these species that spends a lot of time jumping about at the surface, like you might associate with something like a humpback whale. They don't show off. No, they don't tend to. It's not saying that they don't breach. If they want to, they can. But yeah, they're not one of these look at me species like a a humpback whale or a dusky dolphin. (laughs) And living out there so remotely, we're probably getting less strandings. We're not finding skulls and and vertebrae washing up. They're sort of hidden yet abundant. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, Generally, because they live so far offshore, I think for a stranding, it's got much further distance to travel for it to wash up on a beach for someone to find. And they may well just sink out there in, in the deep sea. You do get strandings of them. Some of the populations that live maybe nearer to some of the island chains in the Caribbean or in, in other sort of island areas, that's where they probably get a lot of them, them washing up. And obviously when they, they de- start decomposing in the sea and just that time it would take for them to, to actually wash up and, and get to the beach. Yeah, once they're, they're floaty and smelly. Yeah. That wonderful stage. Yeah. What's a day in the life of a beaked whale? How are they spending their time? if they're being all cryptic and avoiding us. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm generalising about beaked whales in general. The one I study is the, the goose beaked whale, Xiphius cavarostris. So that's the one that I know the most about, but there are a couple of other species. But for, for those Xiphius, they tend to spend the, the majority of their time under the water. So these guys have this pattern of diving where they, they dive deep on, and if we say, again, it's all sort of averages, average an hour to do a foraging dive. So a deep dive for them is crazy deep, I think. It's like thousands of meters down. Wow. They can dive and they forage. The only reason we're, we're assuming they're foraging down there is because they create these echolocation clicks that we've other people have associated in other species to be searching for food and these these sort of regular clicks you get followed by these buzzes which we assume is them capturing prey so they dive deep these foraging dives and then they come up to the surface for about on average two minutes where they're breathing actively breathing and then they do this series of some people call them bounce dives um, some people call them shallow dives which is slightly misleading because these they then do these series of dives that are in theory, shallow, but it's still to three, four hundred meters. Oh, that's weird. I know it's really weird. It's almost like a deco stop. They they sort of stretch their body to its limit and then come back up shallower. Well, yeah, that's sort of the theory in that they do these big deep dives and then they they're doing these shallower dives, which we call an inter deep dive interval. So just that time they're still diving, but it's the time between those big deep dives before they they head out again. So you get what is sort of these patterns of one really deep dive and then maybe four or five shallower dives with some uh, two minutes at the surface between and then they're back to a deep dive. That's incredible. Yeah. So little rest after pushing, you know, no, no free diver is going to turn around and go straight back in after two minutes of huffing on the surface. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I guess I've, I've looked quite a lot at, at that diving behavior and, and we can get into that, I guess, with with how they're doing that. But yeah, it's, it's a really interesting an approach to be diving that deep, breathe for a couple of minutes, and then for any other animal, it would be going deep again. But for them, it's shallow. And they seem to, on the deep dives, they seem to be heading for the seabed. And then I'm guessing on the shallower ones, of course, they're going to be in the in the more open ocean. So what are they doing when they're 
down there? Do we think they're, have we got gut content analysis? Do we know from any of the strandings what they're eating? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So back to the first bit about are they, they dive into the seafloor. We think that's what they're doing. And we've just been trying to explore that a little bit with some of our acoustic tags that we put on the whales to see if we can get really cool bottom echoes, like echoes from their echolocation clicks that are coming back off the bottom. <laughs> You're listening in on their sonar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen in to see what they're doing, how they're using that environment. So yeah, generally we think they tend to forage within a few hundred meters of the seafloor, but other populations, that isn't necessarily what they're doing all the time. So yeah, we think they're sort of bethypelagic foraging down, maybe using the, the drop-offs and the seafloor and the features down there, and then diving down to more sort of just open ocean, doing whatever they're doing on those shallow dives. Oh, and there's some thoughts of what me and Alan were on a paper a few years back, finding these weird traces uh, on the seabed, these weird sort of, it looks almost like stitching, like a, a little trough at regular intervals. And is the thought that they are, they're actually sifting through the seabed, they're actually pushing that snout? into the sediment and looking for things buried or do we not really know what they're doing down there? Yeah, we, well, there is some thought of that, definitely. Yeah, these beaked whale troughs that people think are associated with, yeah, the, the whales going right down to the seafloor. So yes, they, they could be doing that. They have these really interesting dentition, if you like, in that they don't have sort of functional teeth. The males have these tusks at the front, so they're not like chewing food as you as you would think of uh, <laughs> and what humans do. But we think they're sort of sucking up prey as they're heading down to the bottom. So yeah, maybe they're sucking things off the floor. Maybe they're foraging mid water. We do have some buzzes from our, our tags where they're they're not potentially not right at the seafloor. So yeah, I think it, we, we're not really sure to be honest uh, exactly what they're doing down there in terms of exactly what prey they're targeting and exactly how they're capturing everything that they're chasing. So not much found in, in the stomachs of, of ones that have been washed up. The, the difficulty always is that a, a dead whale that washes up is not a healthy whale. So it's kind of the opposite of a survivorship bias. You don't, you don't see what a healthy whale is eating. You just see what killed one. <laughs> yeah. So there has been some stomach contents analysis for, for this species that sort of suggested it's this sort of squid and, and deep water fish that they're potentially eating, maybe some little squid beaks in there. But the thing with these guys is because they spend so much time under the water, we don't know when they're digesting their food because all of their time once they go below sort of 100 meters depth in theory they're collapsing lungs and, and shutting things off with their adaptations of their, their diving physiology so we don't know how when they're digesting things and maybe they're eating very small things that di digest very quickly so there often isn't a huge amount of stomach contents there or maybe when they strand as you say they're they're not as healthy whales, maybe they expel that stomach contents, but there isn't a huge amount of information. And, and often as well, once by the time they're on the beach, they're in a pretty nasty mm. condition. <laughs> uh, so I think probably the best, a lot of the best information on stomach contents is from whaling records, actually, when they were catching healthy whales. Oh, wow. And you could, if there's any stomach contents information there. But generally the thought is sort of squid and deep water fish. But I sort of, I'm sort of hoping you could tell me what, what deep water <laughs> what fish they're gonna be they were eating yeah, at, at those depths. Well, it's got to be worthwhile. Like It's a huge effort. It must take so many calories to do this. So it's got to be profitable. They've got to be consuming more calories when they're down there. Yeah. I think what's the average like deep dive and what's the kind of record we currently have for them so on average they're diving for about an hour at a time but they're not foraging for that whole time and these guys have quite a different we're sort of looking into those different foraging strategies in terms of they don't tend to actively echolocate for a lot of the dive which things like sperm whales and pilot whales do people find sperm whales in the wild by using a hydrophone because you can hear their clicks and then you can track them underwater because generally when a sperm whale's under the water, it's clicking all the time. Whereas beaked whales tend to dive and then just start clicking when they're, when they're foraging. They do click for a reasonable amount of that dive, but there seems to be a very definite period when they're clicking and actively foraging and the rest of the time they're very quiet. At least they're not making what we would think were foraging clicks. So it's about an hour that they're diving, but say the proportion of time they're foraging is, is probably less than half of that. They have have been recorded down to almost 3,000 meters, which is insane. Yeah. But the whales that we look at is mostly like 1,500 meters is probably the average. We we have recorded some long duration dives, like crazy long duration dives, uh, you know, like well over a few hours, which seems insanely long for them to be under the water. Holding your breath for multiple hours yeah, and depth. diving to over 3,000 meters deep yeah. is nuts. 
and active, <laughs> actively foraging as well, right? That's the thing. Yeah, not just having a rest down there. Yeah, it's not that they're hibernating or something. They're actively doing something whilst they're there. If I was to do that, I'd be, and especially at that kind of depth, you get the, your rat tails and you get your sort of deeper sharks and you get things that are long lived and put lots of energy into their livers. There's lots of energy storage. So a nice, nice fatty deep sea fish liver would seem pretty appealing, but by the sounds of their, their jaw structure, they, they can still only consume small things. And then we were talking about one species, the, the male's tusks actually grow over the, the beak and they, they can't really open their mouth anymore. It's a bit of a straw that they're feeding through. Yeah, it's hard to know the size, you're right, of the fish that they could actually actively forage. And, and these whales, these sort of strap tooth whales, it's their tusks. So the males have these two teeth at the front that erupt, say, into what are sort of tusks. And in this one species, they almost like fold over each other, over the, the beak of the whale, which means that it would really restrict how much it could open its mouth. So whether it's just sucking something off the sea floor or licking the <laughs> sand at the bottom, I don't know. You know, it's just the mud at the bottom. It's hard to know, but it's a really interesting trade-off between these tusks in males, which we thought are maybe used for helping with reproductive success and showing the, the fitness of the male and we certainly see a lot of a lot more scars on the males um, as opposed to the females that we think are caused by these tusks. So there's potentially aggressive interactions between the males, which suggests, obviously supports that idea that those tusks are used in some sort of, or there's some sort of display going on for, for reproductive access to, to females. But yeah, it really does, it's that trade-off. It really does seem to hinder, or it would appear it would hinder what they could then forage on when they're, they're actually down foraging. So you can't do something like this lightly. There must be loads of adaptations that they have to, to deep diving. And you mentioned their lungs collapsing. What are some of the, the sort of super deep sea adaptations to, to air breathers, which just feels so weird? Yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because for, for these, these deep divers, you have a division of resources, if you like, that, that most animals or mammals don't have to deal with. So you've got sort of air at the surface and, and food at depth. And you have to go for a different physiological state to access two of your main really important resources, which is not something that generally happens in, in mammals. So it's, it's quite interesting. So all divers, when they're, they're foraging at depth, obviously they, they're not, they can't breathe, the air breathers, obviously. So they need some way to have improved oxygen storage in their tissues, in their blood, to be able to provide their organs with oxygen while they're diving. Because remember, they're actively moving as well. So there's, there's metabolism going on there. They obviously deploy this dive response, which we, we do see in human free divers as well, where you get a slowing of the heart rate, this bracharycardia, where your heart rate slows and sort of a redistribution of blood flow. So the body would distribute blood and, the, and this is what, what we think happens with the whales. Obviously, they, they distribute blood to those more important organs like your brain and your heart, as opposed to sending blood to the peripheries of your, your limbs and, and your skin. So they have that and they, they have a lot of, physi I'm not a physiologist, but they have a lot of sort of physiological adaptations with the types of muscles they have, the amounts of myoglobin, which obviously is very good at storing oxygen in the tissues. And even how much they invest in, in things like brain tissue. So they actually have quite small brains. Oh. So they invest less in these sort of tissues that are metabolically expensive, if you like. So there's a huge range of adaptations that, that these guys have. I was reading as well that the, the lungs collapsing, as horrible as it sounds, is actually a good thing because diving that deep they would have all sorts of gas issues and i think there was the sh shallow water blackouts as well so it was almost by the lungs collapsing and they're no longer performing gas exchange it kept them safe from say getting knocked at depth and then on the way back up just as they were sort of approaching shallow water blackout that's when the lungs would would reinflate not with any fresh air but just with the same air that was in there but compressed almost away uh, would give a little oxygen boost just at that last last hurdle which is just amazing this seems like such a, a push of what of what they're capable of yeah yeah they are really fascinating actually because obviously the most animals have, have got super adaptations to the, the niches they exploit but yeah that the hydrostatic pressure that you're dealing with is a real challenge of, of diving because so your airfield structures obviously get compressed and that would potentially put put nitrogen would enter your bloodstream so that's where your risk of the, the bends come so by collapsing those airfield structures then you're you're regulating 
the chances of that happening, if you like. And there's also evidence from a lot of divers. I don't know we've got it from beat whales, but I believe some of the seals that often they'll breathe. They almost like breathe out before they dive in a way to get rid of that <laughs> excess air because they're going to collapse those those airfield structures. So, yeah, it's like these, these two challenges of metabolizing without respiration. So their tissues are constantly using oxygen at depth, but obviously they can't renew their oxygen stores. And then that hydrostatic pressure where air-filled structures are going to be compressed and could potentially, um, as you come back up, as you say, there's that risk of the bends as as nitrogen would enter the bloodstream in the bubbles and, and cause the bends. So they're clearly super adapted to be able to to deal with those challenges. This is really, really interesting. No wonder we we see so little of them. There's almost a the thought that they were they've kind of gone so far down this niche as they were they were almost forced out. Um, I think some, one of the theories was it was to avoid killer whales, and that might also explain why they are so quiet until they actually get down to depth to feed. They're actually quite stealthy by nature. Do, do you think that holds true? Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot of thought on that in terms of predation. So with, with all mammals, I think, especially with marine mammals, there's this sort of flight or fight hypothesis where certain species are able to potentially ward off a predator. So a social group of, of pilot whales, for example, might be better equipped to be able to, to ward off a predator. But, but beaked whales are generally in these uh, much smaller groups that sort of, we don't know if they're social groups with, with the guys we study, but we certainly seem to have individuals that we see frequently in our one area, but we're, we're sort of trying to look at that social behaviour. But yeah, when, you, when you're in a small group, then maybe the, the impact from predation uh, the best thing to do is, is just try and get out of the way or stay as cryptic as you possibly can. So yeah, with these beet whales, there's certainly, there are examples of killer whales predating beet whales. So yeah, the, the thought is that because they, they don't have the ability to potentially fight off a killer whale, the best thing is to stay cryptic and, and out of the way and not make too much noise, which is maybe why they only start clicking when they're ready to start foraging. And go somewhere no one can follow. Yeah. There's going to be very few animals that can pursue them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can actually dive that dive that deep. So yeah, so that that is definitely uh, one of the trains of thought in terms of a lot of their behavior is driven by that this cryptic behavior is driven by that that ability to to deal with predators, have a have a strategy to deal with predators. So to to flip to your work, you've mentioned a few interesting things. You've mentioned acoustic tagging, you've mentioned recognizing individuals. What is your research like? How how are you studying something that seems to be well so well hidden? Yeah, I sort of flip between really liking beat twelves and really hating beat twelves <laughs> because it's they're really, really challenging to work with, but it's super rewarding, I guess, when you when you can work with them. With any marine mammals, I think a lot of the well-studied groups and populations are in places where they're accessible. And we're very lucky in the, the study site that I work with. And, and I have to mention here, I was before I was at Plymouth, I was over at, at Duke University in, in the US working with a great group of people out there that sort of developed this study on, on beaked whales. So Andy Reid's group and Doug Nowacek's group. And they basically were out off Cape Hatteras, which is on the east coast of the US. So there's, there's a drop off quite close to shore. It's still about sort of 40 miles, but it's close in, in terms of other places. Fuel cost isn't so bad. Yeah, yeah. So you can, well, we do, you can get out, out and back in the day, but you, you have to sort of go see a chiropractor afterwards. But yeah, it's, it is sort of a, an accessible place for beaked whales. Um, but they, when they were out there doing some other studies, they were very, took some great observations that, oh, they look like beaked whales. And then we're seeing them again. And then there was some, another group that were running some aerial surveys that spotted these guys, these beat whale groups out there. And then a student put out some acoustic recorders and we're starting getting detections of beat whales. So we're building up an area of where there's sort of a hot spot of these these beat whales. And now we sort of know a rough area where they're more likely to be. So it's challenging when you're out there and really you can only see them in very low sea states. So sea states zero on one, which is basically when there's no white water on the surface because they're very, very cryptic. As I say, they just sort of come up, they breathe and they go again. So it's a lot of time looking at the surface of the water and it's a lot of time just seeing nothing. (laughs) And then (laughs) when we do see animals, you've got, you know, a very short window of a few minutes to actually get over and look at these guys. We spend a lot of time taking photos of them because with all marine mammals, generally there's some part of their body that has natural marks and whether that's their dorsal fin, that's usually the easiest thing because it sticks out above the surface of the water. So you can take photos of those dorsal fins and you can match individuals because those once they get those marks on their fins, they don't tend to change unless they get more marks over the top. But if you get enough 
regular photos, you can match individuals over time. So that's how we know that we're seeing the same individuals. With the Cuvier's beak twelves, they have these really different body colorations. As the males get older, they get more white, which is really interesting. Uh, I don't, not quite sure we know exactly why that is, but they, that does actually a white whale is much easier to see than a, a brown whale. <laughs> so we, it's really just looking and putting yourself in the right position and spending a lot of time out there looking. And obviously we have many days where we see nothing, but we have many great days as well where we where we do see them. And you're you're actually getting tags onto them. How how are you managing to approach and and get something onto the body. Yeah, so there's the tags that, that we use, these these sort of D-tags, these archival tags, and D-tags were, were developed by a group of very clever people at Woods Hole, led by, by Mark Johnson and Peter Tyaka a number of years ago. And they're very specialist archival tags that record accelerometry information and then acoustics. And we, we're able to just put them onto the whales with a very big, long carbon fibre hole that just sort of sucks on the back of the whale so it's so it's not an invasive tag um and then after we have to think about how long we're going to put them on for because where we work if the tag pops off then it could be off on the um, on the gulf stream across the ocean because you have to be able to go and pick it back out the water so it's very much you need people that have got strong arm muscles and say but but very special skills so we've got some great boat drivers that have got lots of experience driving around whales. You have to approach very carefully. Um, you have to often take many services, many hours watching the whales till you know exactly who you're going to try and tag. So, And it's all done obviously under permitting from the Marine Fisheries Service and, and NOAA and under the Marine Mammal Protection Act in the, in the US. So it's a very... It's a very strict permitted activity um, and only a few people can actually do it. So we're very lucky that we have the the skills in our, our field team to be able to do that. I think I'm starting to see this sort of the frustration and elation at this kind of work because I bet there's, like you say, there's lots of waiting around. There's lots of picking the right moment, but then the success is, is huge. And then there's the whole other thing. You need to recover these tags to get the data off. Yeah, we do. And that's always fun. Um, so there's, <laughs> they have like a little uh, VHF antenna in them. So when they're at the surface, they do beep so we can track them. But we have, again, some people with some great tracking skills in the ocean trying to trying to pick a, a little bleeping tag off the surface of the water and direct the boat to, to where it is until we can see it in the water and then pick it out. So yeah, it's it's a challenge. It's not without its challenges, but it's it's super rewarding work and, and involves a really large team of people. So it's by no means my project in isolation. It's lots of people working on it. Cool. We'll make sure on the show notes we give uh, we give this as a jumping off point and, and lead on to papers and, and websites where people can find out a little bit more. Yeah, that'd be great. There's a lot of there's a lot of really interesting stuff coming out with beak twelves now. Um yeah. And it's it's a lot of it for studying beak whales is about the the ability to have the tools to collect the data really so we're not very good in their natural environments as as individuals ourselves so we do need to use some technology to help us collect that those data that we need it's, it's the same as with us it's yeah. technology led you're limited by your capabilities and yeah as new tech comes online that's how you do it yeah completely saying that we really struggle and this might be sort of out of your area of expertise but you mentioned that we have the same dive response or a similar dive response why have we still got that is this something that's within most mammals yeah, it's a good question. And I say I'm not a I'm not a physiologist or a, or a human <laughs> evolutionary biologist, I guess. But um yeah, I think just for any any air breathing mammal, there is that inbuilt response perhaps from the original evolution of of mammals from the ocean uh, that you have this sort of inbuilt response of you don't actively breathe underwater and you sort of your body goes into a preservation mode because it's not your normal habitat by by conserving energy and Taking those those measures, I guess, of a potentially slowing heart rate. Although I think probably for your average human, when you're thrown into cold water, I'm not sure that that dive response kicks in as well as it does. <laughs> it for, can be overridden. Yeah, it can be overridden. <laughs> Whereas a free diver that very much trains to go to depth is much better at controlling those uh, dive response metrics. Usually we give folk an opportunity to undo a cliche, but I feel this is just not in the public knowledge, really. Not many people know about beach whales. So if there is, maybe, is, is there anything that is often misreported that you'd like to set the record straight on? Probably that people generally just think sperm whales are the deepest dive in whales and the beak whales definitely go deeper than them. So that's probably, but it, it's just because sperm whales are more well known and people are much more likely to have seen them or heard about them. And everyone does that classic giant squid fighting a sperm whale. Yes. The, the battle we never see kind of thing. So these 
quiet, subtle whales snuffling up probably little fish and squid. But they, it seems like they want to be forgotten. They want to be sort of overlooked so they can they hide do. away. I think they're quite happy just getting on with their, their everyday lives. I mean, the only real press that they have they got here, do you remember there was the Thames whale? And that was a beaked whale. Yes. So oh, that was a beaked whale, the Thames whale. I think it was a northern bottlenose whale, but I don't know. But yeah, that's sort of probably the, if you said the Thames whale, people probably know the Thames whale, but don't know it was a beaked whale. Okay, so that was that. Didn't that end up in the Natural History Museum? It did. I actually, when Kirsty was working there, she went and showed me that we went and looked at the dorsal fin. Oh, so, yeah. a, a famous <laughs> beaked whale. So yeah, that's probably the most famous view. And then a few years ago, there was quite a big mass stranding on the west of Scotland, but I'm not sure I remember how that. well that was reported. And generally they are reported to strand with military sonar. But yeah, that's, that's sort of how they were getting more visible to to people was this link between human activities and, and beak whales, which is where a lot of my research work is looking at how their diving changes with the effects of noise. Is the link pretty strong? It does seem to be our activities that are disrupting them. Well, it's it's complicated. There's a couple of published papers actually about it where it, they do seem to react in terms of some sort of behavioural response, but we don't really know the mechanism and that's sort of what we're, we're looking for now. So I don't think it's unsurprising though that if there's a loud noise somewhere, then things respond to it. I mean, I think that's pretty yeah. commonly known of mammals. Shouldn't be controversial, really. Yeah, it shouldn't really. be that controversial, <laughs> but there's certainly suggestion that some mass strandings in beat whales are associated with military activities in different parts of the world. So there's definitely, there's published information on that. So some a lot of our work is starting to look at why that might be, because obviously it's not all the time. <laughs> so you're yeah, just trying to tease out what might be the mechanism that would cause animals to react in a different way. And it, that's challenging to study because yeah. there's so many different aspects of the, you know, social behavior and age classes of the animals and where they're distributed, all of those things that, that we don't really know a huge amount about for beak whales. The data points are so sparse, yes. even, even with the data we have, it's like, well, is, is this lining up? Is this? Yeah. And, it, and it's interesting. The other thing, I guess, for these guys, when you think of the deep divers, sperm whales utilize very similar niches in terms of breathing at the surface and foraging at depth, but you've sort of got one species that's colonized the world in a very successful you know, populations in, in many oceans, whereas beaked whales seem to do, have the same sort of strategy of diving deep to forage, but, but they're split into a lot of different species that seem to be more, even though there's quite a few populations around. They're obviously not roaming and mixing. Yeah, it's well, we don't really know how, where, how far they go, but it's interesting, I guess, for the evolution of, of species, like the strategy in sperm whales just resulted in one species, where for beaked whales, we've got like 22 different species that are sort yeah. of not isolated as such, but more restricted in their distribution in, in different areas. So yeah, things like that are really interesting and we don't really know too much about what's driving that. Just thinking, actually, you know, I had a past life as a marine mammal observer. Okay. And one of our best tools, especially for, for cryptic species, was PAMS, was passive acoustic monitoring. Yes. And I would have to do a search for marine mammals in the area before they could start acoustic acquisition, so that before they start firing these air guns that bounce sound waves off the bottom. And we'd miss these. Yes. They're, they're quiet at the surface. They're really, really <laughs> subtle. And yeah, it would be really hard to mitigate against disturbing them other than knowing that they're in the area. Yeah, definitely. And they do one of the one of the things that has come up from sort of the responses to sound is they do potentially stop clicking as well. So that was one of the big sort of is is that really impacting them if there's lots of noise and you interrupt their foraging behavior, then that could obviously have knock on effects. But yeah, in that in that instance there's something going on so they're just even more quiet than they would normally be. <laughs> Their instinct is very much to hide yes, and it yes. makes it difficult. Yeah, yeah. They are fascinating animals, but yeah, we do come across a lot. It's like what what are they doing that? Why are they doing that? I don't know. It doesn't make sense. It looks like such hard work. <laughs> it does. It does. And if you sort of plot them with body size and oxygen storages, you know, across your average curve or line across mammals, they don't sort of fit in very well. So they're clearly adapted in ways that we don't really fully understand. Are they, are they the aquatic bumblebee? Are they the, you, when you do the physics, this shouldn't work. <laughs> yeah, it's a hummingbird or something. Or, yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, almost. They're obviously doing something we haven't fully understood because this doesn't look profitable. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's like, how is this really a good strategy? <laughs> But clearly it is because there are 22 spe at least 22 species and they are in populations yeah. all over the place. So they're clearly doing well. But I guess the main concern with noise is that maybe there's a, a bigger impact on some of those populations. But we really don't know that much yet. But we're getting there. This is a total tangent. But do the mothers leave their calves? 
or do they dive shallower when they've got a a little one? Good question. Um, we don't know. In our population, we haven't got that many sightings of calves. There, there are some, obviously, but we don't really know when the calving periods are or if there are periods or whether these guys, maybe these guys just have to, as soon as they're born, they have to be able to dive. And maybe those mothers don't dive as deep. Because of our permitting, we don't put tags on mums with calves. Yeah, that would, that would make sense. But then uh, I'm getting sort of sucked into thinking about this now, yeah, because they, they, they would have been diving with their mother in utero when the female was pregnant. If she's still doing these deep dives, the fetus is undergoing this as well. I know it's not got air, as much of a, an airspace issue, but it's experiencing these pressure cycles. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I there's no so idea. much we don't know. I know. I know. It's for, for such a large group of mammals, right? Well, it's one of the least yeah. known groups of mammals and there's all these like just fundamental basic questions even for our work now we know i say we can infer when they're foraging from the clicks but in terms of other behavioral state or we don't really know like when when do they sleep when do they digest food when do they reproduce when do they socially interact when you know when do they do all these things that other mammals do (laughs) yeah how do you coordinate how do you find your pod again when you the more like it's an immediate wow And then the more I think about actually how an organism lives like this, it's just like, how about that? How about that? How about that? Like, it's really difficult way of living. It's fascinating. And we had a, one of the guys I work closely with, Will Trophy, he's, he's done some great manuscripts on looking at sort of social cohesion and and whales. He's some nice parts of whales potentially diving together. So we do believe there's some social aspect to it. But again, how do you conduct those social relationship at 2000 meters when everything and your body's turned off and then how do you find each other again in this vast ocean how do you have the energy to spare to flirt while you're deep diving <laughs> yeah right and, and i say the work and the work i did on um diving limit we sort of assumed that on those the long duration dives there would be these extended periods of recovery in terms of how long they were breathing for at the surface and we just didn't see that which again it's like, well, this doesn't make any sense. So no, maybe their abilities are even beyond what we think their extra abilities are. So really nice, interesting questions. Um, and, and probably we are, we are sort of limited by the, the technology we have to record data on them more than anything else. Oh, still so much. I've really got thinking about them now. There's still so much to learn. So this is a really, really fertile ground. But I understand your frustration as well with, with wanting to know. Yes. Um, but thanks for, for coming on and, and sharing Sharing what we do know, I have a newfound appreciation for them as a as a deep sea visitor. Yes, they are. I think they're very much. I sort of feel they're almost like surface visitors, though. I sort of feel they belong to you guys, as <laughs> they spend a lot of time Team deep in sea. your deep sea in your deep sea area. They're almost like just yeah, surfaces rather than divers because they're really not on the surface very much. So yeah, they're much more at home in, in the deep sea environment than they are anywhere else. Okay, honorary members. Yes, honorary members of the deep sea. We'll be adding them to your deep sea conferences. <laughs> we should, we should. I want to learn more. Thanks so much for having a, a chat with us, Nicola. No problem. Thank you. I think 2,990 metres is quite significantly beyond the 200 metre mark. I think they deserve to be called a deep sea diving whale. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. It's the air breathing. Well, because you've got there's, there's records of sea snakes at 250 metres. And it's like, well, okay. That's not, it's not that much into it, but pushing 3,000 meters is commendable. Yeah, going fully abyssal. Special mention, shall we say, a special mention. Yeah, yeah. And they, they seem to spend like most of their time down there anyway. It's not like they, they do one deep dive and then yeah. recover. And there was that, uh, that paper we came across a while back where they, they tested the mechanical strength of the skull. Yes. And thought it was, they, they could dive to 5,000, theoretically. Wow. Which then weirdly syncs up with the lice, the, the overpressurized lice. Yeah, I remember that. Also, other than the penguin, do you, do you know how the deepest diving seabird is? No. Penguins don't count because they're kind of like in the water all the time. So penguins, obviously, they can go at 500 meters, which in itself is mental. But this is a thick build myrrh. It can go dive to 210 meters. Why? That's a proper bird, like a flying bird. <laughs> do you think that makes the, the penguins a bit insecure? Because they're like, oh, we're great in the water, but we've sacrificed flying. And then this thing just whizzes past them. It's like, eh. I got both. Yeah, I don't know. I think all this kind of mad. Narwhals can go down over fifteen hundred meters as well. Full of facts today. Well, Nicola mentioned the mammalian diving response, which is something that all mammals have, which I'm I'm finding really interesting because it's quite it's more complex than I realized. There's a lot that sort of gets switched off and, and monitored and and changed when the diving response is triggered, and I find it really weird that we still have that. You know why? So we tried to talk to the whales, but they weren't telling us anything about what it actually feels like. 
So who can we talk to about what it actually feels like to be a deep diving mammal? Beefy. Be- I'm just meant to know what that means. Beefy. No, there's a guy who's affectionately often referred to as Beefy, but his, uh, his real <laughs> name is uh, Dr. Ryan Beecroft. He's a very important member of our deep diving submersible team, but he's also a keen freediver. So he does it for real. He does what the whales do. And uh, he's capable of communicating that better than a whale that can only speak in long, low-frequency hums. Let's talk to Beefy about what it's like to be a deep diving mammal. So joining us today to talk more about diving very, very deep is Dr. Ryan Beecroft, who at the moment is in Mexico, and he's one of our sub-engineers on the project who happens to be an avid freediver. So we thought we'd get him to talk more about what it is to do this, because it turns out the whales can't tell us directly. So Ryan's the next best thing to trying to talk to the animals. So welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thank you for having me on, Professor. That's all right. So for those unfamiliar with freediving who might be listening, can you talk us through what it actually is in terms of the rules of the, if I can call it a, is it a sport, I suppose it is. What are the rules of the game? So yes, it's a sport, a hobby. Uh, I guess a lot of people get into it through spearfishing. So it's like glorified snorkeling, basically. You, you uh, take a inhalation on the surface, hold your breath, and then you dive, I guess, as deep as you can or as deep as you want to go on that one breath. It's not like scuba diving. You don't have to exhale on the way up or mm. it's all about holding holding your breath and making or utilizing uh, the amount of available oxygen in your lungs. So what's the current depth record then? How far can people go? So the deepest dive, I think the record was actually broken quite recently, but it's 136 meters constant weight. Constant weight is the person actually kicking down themselves uh, and they use a monofin for this. Right. But there's actually three disciplines for depth diving. So that's constant weight, uh, free immersion, no fins, and actually a fourth now, which is constant weight by fins. Right. So what's, what's your personal depth record of interest? Uh, my personal best at the moment is 56 meters. Wow. Yeah, which compared to these guys, you know, is nothing. They're, they're, they're playing in a completely different ball game. But yeah, they've taken years and years of training and it's a very slow adaption to the depth well because i think most people would be familiar with sort of diving in a swimming pool even two or three meters you can feel the physiological effects of of the water pressure to take that to 56 is is insane in my opinion but <laughs> yeah yes so what do you do to prepare for that physically well you know you obviously have to go through some preparation on the surface before you make the dive and that's kind of where we're looking at the analogy between yourself and and how these these animals are doing it what, what do you have to do so on the surface it's key for humans, I guess, that aren't accustomed to diving to such depths is uh, calming yourself down and not being anxious so that you don't tense your muscles up. You want to be relaxed so that when you take a large breath on the surface, you're able to fill your lungs to their maximum capacity. Mm -hmm. And there's even techniques that people use to mechanically force more air into their lungs. Is, so is, is it also like a mental preparation as well, then? It's a bit of both, really, isn't it? You're trying to prepare yourself mentally by calming yourself down. In my experience, it's more mental than physical once you've done the training. Yeah. And, yeah, by training, I mean taking the time to let your body get used to the pressure, the pressure that you're not used to, and also, you know, physically having kicked 200 meters underwater in a swimming pool and have, have your muscles used to building up lactic acid when they're anaerobic. Yeah. So on a dive like this, how do you decide how far to push it? Do you have a target depth in mind? You say, right, today I'm going to do 40 meters and tomorrow I'll maybe do 50 meters. Or do you just go and just let your body decide when it's too much and then come back? No, no, you, you definitely have a target depth. So for me, the way I would approach it would be today I'm going to do close to a max dive. So I'll do a 50 meter dive and mm -hmm. I physically set the line that I'm that I'm diving on to 50 meters and I can't go past that. Right. There's no, oh, I'm, I'm feeling really good today. Maybe I'll do 60 meters because you don't know how your body is going to adapt to or feel at you know, like 10 meters doesn't sound like much, but it's actually physically and on your body, the pressure change is quite a lot. Mm. So what does it feel like? So what does it feel like? Well, everyone, I guess, can relate to the, the pressure they have in their ears, you know, and they, that's, you have to equalize yeah. these, uh, these voids of air because you have all this pressure pushing in. 
and once you get once you master the equalization techniques which take a lot of effort on their own i guess the most prominent feeling you have is uh actually on your like diaphragm and around your ribs mm. and even your throat below your uh your epiglottis mm-hmm. because that area when you have water pushing in on you at a depth around 40 meters which is your residual volume so your, your lungs can't shrink anymore that's where you notice like the feeling of a hard push or the pressure on your on your chest wow and so <laughs> given what you just said when when you're doing this What's going through your head? Because it's such a technical thing to do. When you're actually down there and at the target depth and then turning back, are you just thinking about doing it or, or is there a moment there where you can actually enjoy it? Is there a moment like even like 50 meters where you take that couple of seconds just to look around and go, huh, here we are? Or is it just purely running through the whole process? Uh, so the, the enjoyment actually, you start your dive on the surface and you kick to a point, say 15, 20 meters, where you then become negatively buoyant. And then you enter a phase called free fall because, mm-hmm. you know, you're no longer displacing the amount of water with your with your lungs expanded because everything's shrunk. Yeah. So from that point on, you free fall and it's actually yeah quite enjoyable. You You relax and you're focusing on equalization. And eventually, once you practice it enough, you get into a flow state where it just becomes natural. When you turn at the bottom, you have to be quite careful that you don't overexert yourself in in that process because you can run the risk of injuring yourself by stretching too much under pressure. And that's how people yeah. can get like an injury called a lung squeeze. Oh, you're going to have to explain the lung squeeze a bit more. <laughs> that sounds horrific. I mean, it's part of the sport that I guess a lot of people don't like to talk about, but in, in deep competitive diving, it's a real thing. So mm. basically within your, within your lungs – you have all this pressure exerted on on your lungs and basically the capillaries rupture and you can have like a little bit of blood coming into either your lungs or more common like your trachea because that area isn't as flexible yeah so you you can injure yourself that way wow i mean it's something that i've actually struggled with quite a lot and has limited my diving uh-huh. and which is which has kind of forced me personally to have to reassess how i train and how i prepare but I mean, there's divers like yeah. the current world record holder who does 136 meters repetitively, like, you know, week after week and has no issues with it. So yeah. it's individual and also somewhat related to uh, what we call like pressure adaption. This is where training and adapting to these these kind of pressures is actually a really important thing and why it takes many years yeah. or should take many years for divers to advance to deep, deep depths. I never thought of that thing you just said before about once you get past a certain point you're now negatively buoyant there must be a weird sort of feeling as you change phase (laughs) that suddenly you're you're free falling i never 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 dawned on me before that would be a thing but of course that makes perfect sense that's quite interesting yeah and for divers they actually focus on you know like at the start of their dive they want to be relaxed so that they enter the free fall phase without you know having a buildup of lactic acid or without having what we call contractions, mm-hmm. which is when you have like carbon dioxide build up in your system, which is like your body's trigger or signal that, oh, I need to breathe. So anyone who's held their breath, you know, for say a minute or two minutes, and then they start feeling uncomfortable and getting that urge to breathe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's actually factored into when you're doing a dive, you know, you want to hit that free fall phase, relaxed, and then, you know, your dive is more pleasant. And if you're relaxed, you have less chance of injuring yourself. And also, you're not stressing your muscles, so you have less chance of becoming hypoxic on the way up. So after the dive, is it a period where you have to recover from a dive? What, what, you know, what's, what's happening to you mentally and physically when you get back to the surface and you're back on the, on the boat? And is that equal to the preparation you need to do beforehand? It depends on a couple of things. It depends on uh, the number of dives you're doing that day. It depends on how deep you're diving and then also the duration of the dives. Right. So for a spearfisher, for example, we might do, say, in a day, I might do 50 dives to 30 meters, which is a lot of dives. Wow. And I, I focus on taking three times my time underwater as a rest so that, you know, I don't have a buildup of nitrogen and I don't run the risk of getting decompression sickness. Yeah. If I'm doing a max dive, I would go, I would do one warm up dive, which is like, to 20 meters and then i would do a maximum dive to say 56 meters and that's it for the day huh interesting you've mentioned a couple of times that you know it takes essentially years and a lot of 
training to do this? Is it something you think anyone could do or are people just somehow naturally gifted at this? I think it's like, I mean, yeah, like any sport, there's people who are just naturally gifted. I think it's a, it's a sport that you actually have to kind of appreciate the risks associated with it. And I think taking your time and kind of enjoying, you know, like enjoying the journey and the, the struggles uh, is quite important because for me, for example, having issues with equalization, I learn a ton of other techniques that allow me to progress my equalization in my ears, uh, which are also important to other aspects of my dive. So I think anyone can do it and it, it's, it's a great sport for anyone or a hobby for anyone to get into, but it's definitely something that should be progressed slowly and, and safely for, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Another thing is, could you explain what we mean by mammalian dive reflex? So the mammalian dive reflex uh, is something that humans, as well as, I guess, marine mammals look to take advantage of in preserving life. And basically for humans, it's initiated uh, at the onset of apnea, which is like holding your breath. And then also by submerging your face or your nasal areas in the water. Uh -huh. So basically what it, what it does is like divers actually look to take advantage of this, I guess, like other mammals by training or getting used to the sensations associated with it so that you, you have a, a rapid slowing of your heart rate. So some divers report mm -hmm. it when they're moving, you know, heart rates below 20 beats per minute, you get start to get really, really cold. Yeah. And then you have like vas vasoconstriction. So all the blood rushes to your, to your heart and to your lungs. Uh, and then the contraction of your spleen. So divers actually look to, I guess, use this in the early stages of their dive so they have you know more oxygen available during their dive cool all right one last question if you've got any interesting anecdotes or stories based on your time free diving uh i guess i've been on the line where i, I grew up diving with a, uh, with a group of friends and we were always competitive with each other um and a, a number of these guys now have gone on to hold national records and some of the best divers going around and one of, one of our in, internal competitions that we have amongst us is uh, who who can take the the deepest poo. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and dare I ask who currently holds the record for that? Uh, I'm not actually too sure who currently holds the record for that, or if or if it's been validated. But someone was in was in the thirty meter mark for a little while. I was going to say, how do you validate that? Do you go if you got to bring back evidence? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can bring pressure sensor and GoPro footage and stuff like that. You know, because yeah, yeah. there's no there's not going to be anyone down there to verify. No, no, and I, I don't think you want to be down there to verify. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one for the Deep Sea Podcast: is who's done the deepest poo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> On that happy note, Ryan, thanks very much for your time. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me along. Cheers, guys. No worries. And that concludes another episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. We now have a supporters page if you want to keep the podcast going. We've listed lots of ways you can help out the show from the free, like leaving a review and subscribing, to becoming a patron or buying merch. Anything like that really supports the show. And thank you so much for uh, yeah for anyone who's given their, their time and money to do that. It helps us keep going as we are on a quest to become self-sustaining as an excuse to continue to do this. Because we do enjoy it. It gives us a chance to catch up. So until the next time, I'll deep see you next time. We abyss you already. If you would like to advertise with the Deep Sea Podcast, feel free to get in touch. Our audience is primarily young people with an interest in science, often undergraduates or people considering a degree in marine science, but it also includes established scientists. Feel free to get in touch if you're interested in reaching these groups. It's something I think I saw on Twitter or something recently about what men think about. And one of them was, why is Iron Man two words and Spider-Man's hyphenated and Batman's all one word? And that weirdly has actually occupied <laughs> a significant part of my thought it's catnip for the male brain yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know it's kind of, it sort of bugs me it's one of these like annoying things about the english language it's like why the hyphen why no hyphen why is batman one word and it's the batman 
I don't know. I don't care enough to actually go and figure it out, but I, 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 I do care enough to think about it on my way to work quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably what was like, um, what could be trademarked. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But, you know, these funny old things that keep you keep you thinking. My day's ruined. <laughs> oh, you're never going to be able to sleep at night because you're sitting this, let's go round and round in your head. Anyway, if anyone knows, write to podcast at armatissociating.com and explain to us yes, please. why that's a thing. Free us. I know it's not entirely got, it's not that deep sea a subject to be talking about, but I feel it's important. <laughs>